Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Today we have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Ilya Rockman. Hello. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting. This is gonna be a lot of fun. You have a great background. Oh, thank you. Very deep background in health, wellness, science. This is really important. So you actually got your uh, degree, your PhD from the University of Chicago. University of Illinois at the Chicago. University of Illinois at yes. Chicago, and then in neuroscience and cell biology. Correct, it was an MD PhD joint prog dual program, and uh, it was a cell biology and neuroscience. And then, and then you went straight in like 15 years now. Uh, you've, been, you've been with UCLA doing clinical medicine course instructing. Correct. You've been an attending physician at the Cedar sinai Medical Center for 15 years. That's a long time to be it's helping It's a long people. tunnel. That's, a, that's a quite a typical medical uh, training and professional tunnel that yeah. I've entered. Uh, and we've uh, also been fortunate enough to take part in several clinical trials as a principal investigator along the same path. So, and yeah. then six years now at IMIX. And then, yeah, this is the sixth, correct, that's the sixth year at IMIX Biopharma. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and the co-founder and CEO. Co-founder and, and CEO. And we have our CEO over here, Ryan Witt, joining us as well. Yeah, what's up, yeah. Ryan? Good yeah. to see ya. Thank you. Um, so, so this is, let's, let's, maybe, let's maybe touch a bit on, before we get into IMIX and what mm -hmm. you're doing now, what has been these last 15 year journey has been like? Because I don't think many people get the perspective into what it's like both being a clinical physician, but mm -hmm. also being a, um, an instructor for others. So maybe tell us about that. So for me, so medicine is a bit more than just uh, a professional endeavor. Most physicians see on, the, uh, on a daily basis uh, what needs to be done and what needs to be done in the most sort of pressing way. Yeah. And we, this uh, urgency we for all like a internally patient. rate what needs to be done the most and where, what yeah. are the areas of need. We acutely and keenly feel that. We feel mm -hmm. it through our patients, patients that we get to know for years, and then we see them go through terrible times. We see them, their families go through terrible times. You can't help but relate, and it, it is the most incredible motivator that I find, at least for myself. And... Uh, you know, jumping ahead a little bit, the, the motivation, the entire impetus for IMIX uh, as, as a company was uh, basically my desire to help not only my patients but some of my friends who are afflicted with, uh, with, with cancer. Yep. So, but being a physician helps me and puts me in a position of being an informed person where I can actually go back and design therapies yep. that go straight to the core of what I feel is missing in the solutions that, are, you know, that I'm currently have in my possession and my, in my toolbox. So. I, I think what you illustrated at the beginning is so important to really lay out for people to get. There's this ranked order mm -hmm. for helping people. So when somebody comes in and they give you some sort of symptoms or issues that's mm -hmm. occurring, you then analyze and make a ranked order based on what is the number one most possible thing that this person has, how can I help treat it, what does that process look like and what would, could be the number two. It's, ba it's a lot like your, your brain's processing, it's like a lot like a machine's right. learning about them and making a prediction um, based on what you think is going on. That ability to feel what somebody's going through and then have this deep emotional connection to wanting to help them is kind of like a big fire under people's butts that work in health and that work in um, as doctors and physicians. I find that historically, that has been the main engine of innovation, at least in, in my industry, in, in, in healthcare. So going back in you know, decades, well, almost you know, uh, centuries now, going back to penicillin, insulin, uh, other antibiotics, uh, first chemotherapies, first immunotherapies, all of those, without exception, were driven by people who saw a promising technology and they wanted to give it to people who desperately needed that. So, and I would venture to even advance that most of those products that we now consider foundational and uh, sort of the, the founding fathers of our technology had a hard time being commercialized because they did not come to us as these godsend commercial uh, yeah, messengers. Yeah. <laughs> these were not 
you know, the most uh, ideally positioned products to be commercialized at a time. So I'd venture to guess that it was the human motivation to help other humans that, that actually forced and brought into being these you know, revolutionary, life-changing, at least for me, I mean, having pneumonia yeah. a couple of times as a child, you know, that, that measly penicillin probably say, you know, saved yes. my life a couple of times yes. easily. Yes. So again, it was something that was driven by somebody, you know, a person's desire, Dr. Fleming's desire to see soldiers not die from these, you know, wounds from yes. uh, infected uh, gun wounds, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's that kind of motivation that overcomes you know, difficulties that every entrepreneur, scientist, uh, you know, anyone who's developing anything, and if we're sitting, you know, in, in the capital of Silicon Valley, people definitely understand what I'm talking about, and it takes perseverance, patience, and really, you know, motivation. It's probably one of my favorite things about the people that sit across from me in that chair is when they speak from a place of heart and mm. from a place of soul when they say that I'm doing this because I care about other people, I care about making the world better. And that has been a continuous theme in, in people trying to make especially health better for people over time. Um, but it's tough because then it has to be balanced as well with being able to make money to further do more R&D, more products, help more people, also uh, potentially invest into other philanthropic endeavors mm -hmm. outside of the field that one is currently in. Absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely, as, uh, as I've shared with you, part of my sort of academic path included going back to business school. This is after being, yes. you know, being a physician and a clinician for uh, nearly a decade because I felt compelled that the, the music that was playing in my head was really not translatable. So if, if products that I knew I could make, that could make millions of people's lives better, it had to be communicated to the business community. I had to, I had to be able to successfully navigate the path that included things that had nothing to do with science, yeah. yet they were equally, if not more important. So I needed to build relationships, alliances in the funding community, yeah. regulatory community, and you name it. Uh, Report can be considered science, though. So, this ability to make relations with people. In, absolutely, yeah. or at least a critical skill. Critical I, skill. I would rank it somewhere up there. Exactly. And I would not diminish it, and I would definitely place it on equal footing. Where, absolutely. You know, foundational technology is fantastic, but not being able to to make it translatable, understood what, what the value of the technology is, not being able to build alliances in order to to uh, deploy that, to bridge the gap, you know, with the valley of death or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it it's, it's a gap of communication more yeah. than anything else. Yeah. So that's what's prompted me to, to go back to business school so I can then translate and put my ideas into, into terms and lingo that was understood by folks. Folks that I needed to, to bring to my side to guide me, to help me, and uh, to make it a reality. So again, jumping ahead, that was the, the, the real luck, success, whatever you want to call it, of being able to bridge the, the valley of death that, that my company has fortunately been able to, to do. I'm really happy that you went through that process. And we have uh, companies like Indie Bio here mm -hmm. that are focused Absolutely. on turning scientists into entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And that whole process is, like you said, pairing together the science with the people skills at the same time. What would you say is, before we get into IMIX, mm -hmm. what would you say is probably one of your favorite takeaways from teaching and mm -hmm. from being a clinician? What would you say is one of your favorite takeaways from this last decade and a half? You know, many people have you know, proposed a similar concept that the only way to truly understand any subject is to be able to do it mm. or teach it mm -hmm. or demonstrate it. You know, and I'm paraphrasing a lot of sm much smarter people have said the, this before. And I find it incredibly, you know, gratifying to, to see the, the, the flicker of real happiness in the eyes of these young aspi aspiring yes. students when they grasp the concept, something they, let's say, they didn't understand before or they consider difficult, challenging, not, not, not very applicable. But when you make it visually understood yeah. and when you show them the relevance yeah. to, to saving somebody's life, 
to, find, you know, to making a diagnosis, to making a, a difference between life, mm -hmm. death, they mm -hmm. see how applicable it is. Mm -hmm. And they see when they understand that, that's you know, some of the most gratifying things I've ever seen in my, in my teaching career. Love now, on it. the clinical side, it's very much the same thing. It's ability to put together divergent pieces of information yeah. that a lot of times fall through the cracks. Uh, you know, as opposed to Silicon Valley, we're not privileged in having a tremendously well-organized information systems. There is an enormous push for that, but it is very difficult because we are at the interface of human interaction and data collection. Yeah. And not very, not very easy thing to, to, you know, to digitize. Uh, so again, being a physician, some of the greatest uh, gratification I get, at least on a you know, couple of times a month, where I feel tangibly I've made a difference. Because I know that I've caught something, I, uh, you know, I treated somebody in a way that uh, wasn't obvious to others before, and I know I've made a difference. I can quantify that, and oh, yeah. I probably prevented a hospitalization. I probably prevented a traumatic event, and I made somebody very, very happy. And again, being in the community, you know the, the, the family of the patients, you know the kids, grandkids, so it, it really, you, you get a lot of value from that. Uh, uh, humanistic value from that. Absolutely. The so expanding the mm -hmm. mind to new dimensions of thought and exactly. understanding and then seeing the look in another person's mm -hmm. eyes when they really get it and they tell you thank you. And that is a Very much so. that that feeling of connection is so profoundly cool. Correct. And it happens a lot to parents with their children as the children. I was gonna say <laughs> exactly. It's so fundamental. It, it's not really confined to to areas of you know just academic teaching. Exactly. It is just so universal. You just feel just universally, exactly. yeah. But then happy. specifically aligning it also with the health and wellness of mm -hmm. people too is so cool because then they go, wow, that's how it's gonna save a life. That's cool. You take yeah. it out of the realm of uh, annoying, little irrelevant, yeah. obnoxious little details yeah. that you just need. You know, I'm forced to memorize, and you put it all together, and that becomes a coherent picture that is important and relevant. So one of my, f there, yeah. one of our close friends and uh, 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 one of the assistants in the production of what we're doing, um, his name's Ryan Cotton, and he mm -hmm. he focuses on biochemical pathways mm -hmm. and pharmaceuticals, and so he showed me this insane. Well, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. With networks and uh, yeah, and, music. <laughs> and then and then all of a sudden, you know, there mm -hmm. is finally something that you see that's mm -hmm. applicable and understandable, and then you're like a Ah, that's how that makes sense. So, okay. So now let's talk. Let's talk about what's been happening these last couple of years. So these last six years, um, you're in. You have two drugs in preclinical. So we we currently have the the entire pipeline is three actually. Three drugs. One okay. is imminently entering human trials. The second one is uh, not far behind. Uh, okay. is in uh, actually in uh, veterinary, veterinary market, correct. And the third one is in the wings. Is in, is still going? Is, behind, is, is, is still okay. in preclinical. Okay, well congrats, you have one in, in yeah, human yeah. clinical. Up our sleeve, yes. So this is oh, all, all in inhibiting tumor resistance. Correct. All three. Correct. Okay, so now let's break this down. So we have uh, a healthy body mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden we have what occurs to even form a tumor typically in the first place? All right, harping back to the confusing biochemical chart. <laughs> now picture that and toss it out of your memory, okay? okay. Get rid of it. Okay. All right. Okay. There is no sequential steps here. Think of parallel processes, mm -hmm. which is partly why mm -hmm. tumors are so difficult, they have been so difficult to, you know, to conceptualize and treat, okay? It's a parallel process. Think of massive parallel evolution happening in multiple yes. cells. Yes, yes. And, and all the different workings of the cell happening exactly at right. the same time. Yes. Exactly. Different portions of the tumor are different you know, city states Whoa. that evolve at the same time. So a tumor is not composed tumor of all of the not, same. Tumor is not a uniform it's mass. A, it's, it's not. A, it's hmm. in the most simplistic form. It's a three-dimensional mass that contains so many local environments that differ from each other that impose Oy. evolutionary drive. 
and as all politics are local, uh, so is the evolutionary pressure. And the tumor is trying to For survive. For the cell populations that are closer to the blood vessel, the tumor pressure is not, a, uh, the evolutionary pressure to survive is not as high as to cell populations that are further removed from a blood vessel, uh -huh, uh -huh. where there's a lot less oxygen, a lot less glucose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's just a very basic, uh, very basic premise uh -huh. that is now well understood, and we, we, we call it the tumor microenvironment. Tumor microenvironment. Coming from a neuroscience background for the, you know, for the last 18 to 20 years, you know, I was taught to think in those terms. So when I, and that is why I made the transition from neuroscience to, uh, to oncology, to, brain, you know, to, develop, to cancer research, is that's where I saw the gap. So cancer was still being treated as a homogeneous mass. Mm. Mm -hmm. without, you know, without respecting the networks within, without uh, paying attention to divergent evolutionary mm -hmm. pressures on each mm -hmm. tumor population. And uh, <coughs> even what's on the outside of the tumor that's resisting that's the exactly treatment. That's exactly right. And what stuff, is the yeah. mechanism? And then, again, as a clinician, what you notice is a very typical path. The patients get their first course of therapy almost universally. Tumors shrink and almost universally. And I'm talking about metastatic uh, cancers. Almost universally, cancers return three, six, nine months later. And then they are progressively less responsive to anything that we give them. So what, what exactly are we talking about right now? So we gain some sort of a, a cancer cells or tumor, Correct. and then there's a treatment. And there's then a what, treatment. What, is that, what is that treatment so normally? So treatments usually still, uh, with the exception of few tumors. Uh, in the metastatic setting, still include radio and chemotherapy. It's beginning to change, and there is rapid innovation as we speak, you know, uh, with immunotherapy and other uh, therapies coming on online. And but, chemotherapy usually takes but traditionally, the entire bodies correct. down. So the chem both chemotherapy and radiation are, well, chemotherapy is given systemically. So it's given intravenously, so it, cir it circulates around the body. It hopes to kill preferentially the rapidly dividing cells, which are the tu rapidly dividing tumor cells. Mm -hmm. And it does so, but, it do but at the same time, because it's a toxin, it induces the very resistance mechanisms that then produce the next generation mm -hmm. of the resistant uh, cancers that, that months, return and they're no longer sensitive. And they're no longer sensitive to multiple other lines of treatments. They're no longer sensitive to chemo. They're no longer sensitive to radiation. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, a lot of times, no longer sensitive to immunotherapies as well. So the question that interested me, how do we break that vicious cycle? Yes. And as it turns out, if you dig, if you dig into basic science that has been, that's been around for a, a little while, uh, unfortunately, some of the literature doesn't come from the oncology literature itself. So you have to sort of expand to other areas of scientific sort of disciplines. And you look at how evolutionarily preserved those uh, resistance mechanisms are, then you begin to actually get curious of what if you can tamper those? Mm -hmm. What if you can inhibit yes. those? Yes. And could we attack them so that yes. not only your standalone therapy, but other therapies Correct. become less susceptible to the escape and to yeah. the resistance emergence. Now, how are you breaking down the resistance of these tumors? So, so what we do is we rec initially the hypothesis was that the tumors are in, in a very sort of overly simplified uh, graphical sort of Im Im image and image and um, analogy is a fetus that is growing inside our bodies, which are placentas that support it. It's actually not that far from the truth mm -hmm. in, in, in that our tumor, tumor cells are usually embryonic versions of ourselves. So they de-differentiate towards the, 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 the fetal or the embryonic form so that they're less immunogenic, that they can attract more blood vessels, because anything that needs to grow beyond a certain size, let's say one cubic centimeter, you have to be able to grow new blood vessels to support the, the growth of this three-dimensional mass. How do you do this? So if you're a tumor, you secrete inflammation, cytokine, inflammation molecules 
So inflammation is the language the tumor uses to communicate and elicit support Resource from us, from, from our own body, except from the host. So then if you extend that logic of thinking, mm. then you think, okay, so it actually uses inflammation to attract support. So instead of trying to kill it with toxins, what if I withhold, what if I block those lines of communication? What if I block the SOS so, you know, yeah. signals from tumors yeah. and we just abort the tumor? Mm -hmm. So the idea mm -hmm. is that you would just stop having that placenta, us, the host, support the parasite growing inside awesome. of us. What yeah. if we cut off? So the, then the hypothesis, of, hmm, so what do we need? We need to selectively deliver to the areas of tumors inflammation blockers. Uh -huh. But not a specific, targeted, because remember, even in the most simplistic uh, schema, we have 20 or 30,000 30, genes. And then all those get spliced and modified. So we're talking about an infinite number of modifications. And that's how we approach oncology now. We target it. And the better targeted we are, the better we consider it, the better known, the more characterized the targets are. Mm -hmm. Which is great if you have a singular, yeah. specific, static disease. We thought it would be terrible for an evolving, dynamic, multi-clonal process. Notice uh, which the solid tumors are. So in the liquid tumors, which are more clonal, it works really, really well. And we see that there's a fantastically successful uh, immuno immunological, immuno-oncological approaches, right? Uh, curing leukemias, lymphomas. We haven't made that sort of a spectacular success on the solid tumor because of the multi-clonal nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, our hy hypothesis was to build a delivery vehicle that would deliver these inflammation suppressors, that would inhibit top-down entire inflammation cascade, yeah. not just any yeah. one, but the head regulators, mm -hmm. and uh, co-load it with a very small amount of a uh, toxic substance that would activate apoptosis, cell death, uh -huh. because in tumors, as in our fetal cells, apoptosis, which is a regulated, controlled cell death, mm -hmm. programmed cell death mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. is actually inhibited. So the switch is off. So how do we flip it back on? We give the anti-inflammatory, really, really potent inflammation suppressor, which reactivates the switch, and then you give the second molecule that flips the switch on. And you then are able to disinhibit and activate Mm -hmm. Cell death in tumors. Okay. So that's All schematically right. what we did. Let, let's see. Let's see. Let's re, let's do a, 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 a re. A sum, let's do a summary. Okay. okay. So we have a tumor that's sending SOS signals. Correct. In the form saying, of cytokines, inflammation molecules. Yes. I am inflamed. I need an, I need exactly. attention from the body. I need attention. I need resources. And then the body is like, okay, give, give, give. So the first step is to is for your this is your intellectual property Correct. is this first part is the first molecule that inhibits the inflammation Correct. of that area. Correct. Specific targeted that that not other parts of the body just that tumors. Broadly it's Broadly. a broad anti-inflammatory yeah. Okay. Okay. And then after you inside the same particle, there's a second molecule. Exactly inside, yeah. Inside the yeah. same molecule, it's a particle. Inside it's, the same nanoparticle. Is the s s second molecule. Yeah. Okay, and then the second molecule is a small cytotoxic. Okay, and then that is what causes apoptosis. Correct. Activation what, of apoptosis. Activation of apoptosis because yes. normally we have apoptosis occurring in the body. Nor Correct. Normally, but the tumor flips it off. It suppresses that. It suppresses yeah. that. Not okay. only that, it gets even more devious. It does two broad things at the same time. I like how you speak about it, devious. Well, like this devious it's, tumor. It's, it's a yeah. fantastically tuned machine yeah, yeah. to survive at any cost. Yeah, yeah. And what it does at, you know, at the same time, not only does it secrete the SOS help me sign, it also secretes signals that activate immunosuppression. It actually activates production of clones of cells that we call T regulatory cells that actually suppress and make our immune system think that we have to protect this new developing tissue. And it actually blocks our own immune system from attacking it. 
Because our T cells are trying to target it and kill it. But However, there's what, two but types. what is the tumor trying to do? It's trying to it, prevent our T it, cells? It activates and actually it activates and, and activates creation of T cells. Of its so own T cells. T cells from our own bone from marrow. Our own, okay. That suppress oh other T cells from killing it. Wow. So there's a little mini war going so on. Exactly. Those T -cells. Exactly. And that is one of the main barriers to immune oncology, which we also think we've uh, sort of found the key to overcome. So this is so interesting. It's an, inter it's an interlinked network. So it, it isn't just, an, just like in any network, if you, you know, displace or if you um, alter any part of the network, you conduct. Because remember, we are walking physical chemistry. We operate yeah. on energies, right? So if you, if you provide any energy, input energy on this side, it's going to transmit some energy, and you're going to get all these unintended consequences. And that's what the network, the, the very much definition of a network effect. Whoa, the way that it's described as a, uh, as a becoming this separate sort of parasitic that's entity exactly, inside exactly. of the body is kind of disgusting. But, and it's, it's, but it's natural. It's a very natural thing that the body ages over time senesces and then at some point right. there are going to be these malevolent things that occur inside Correct. of us and then now we have to figure out how to uh, inhibit that suppress it mm -hmm. turn it around hopefully um, kill it uh, right then and there in a targeted way that doesn't affect the other parts of the body and maybe then we can live um, longer maybe then Precisely. our grandparents and our parents uh, and their kids can live longer. Uh, and actually, this argument is very, very interesting. Okay. Re recently, recently, I, I stumbled into um, Eric Weinstein's and June Yoon's mm -hmm. and Aubrey de Grey's arguments about, about this because I love all three of them, hung out with all three of them, hosted them on the shows and everything. And the recent sort of push for longevity yeah. is actually for creativity, for education, Precisely. for thriving and prospering. This has nothing to do with being some immortal God. This has everything to do with just like, I want to learn more about the cosmos that we live in and I want to be able to be more creative in this world. And I really, over longer periods of time, and that really resonated with me because I think about how little I know about everything and I just want to keep learning and making all these great mm -hmm. connections and more. I want to hang out with other really creative people. And, and so um, th that's this argument is that, you know, not only do you not want your grandparent to die when they're 60, but you also want them to potentially be able to uh, do more creative work for another mm -hmm. couple decades that can potentially have more uh, moments of innovation. What if they come up with the next big thing when they're right. 68 um, and they weren't able to? So this mm -hmm. is all why it's so important and so uh, so crucial. Yeah, so uh, the things that we, that we now tend to call it in healthcare is health span, right? We not only focus on lifespan, we want it to be a health span. So you want to extend the functional, high-quality years. Yeah. Why? So from my past life of neuroscience, we know that with age, brain is a funny machine. It actually gets better in terms of creativity, in terms of finding novel solutions, mm. because we're able to make new, co new, collection, yes. new, uh, new connections based on the synaptic plasticity in, you know, stimulated and produced by our experiences, by integrating visual, auditory, and all kinds of cognitive inputs. Uh, yeah, so I very much uh, su you know, support that vision, and, and I see that in action also. How can we retain the 13-year-old homeostatic capacity until we're 80? That would be so amazing. Like, you're 80 years old, and you just, like, don't feel your yeah. body comes right yeah, back yeah, to yeah. equilibrium much better. Um, so okay, so now let's let's go let's go deeper into this. So mm -hmm. in the in the moment of my body, let's say turning um, forty, let's mm -hmm. just start from from that point quick. What actually occurs in the first formation of the tumor? What's what's like the first sign that the tumor has started? You actually reminded me of a great point. Okay. So if we go back to and we actually consider tumor initiation or origination in its more holistic sense. I think it would probably be useful to reframe it a little bit and get away from the hyper-zoomed-in focus okay. on the tissue where okay. the tumor comes from, where how most of us think about tumors now. And actually think of it in terms of it takes two to tango. So it mm. actually takes the, the number one predisposing factor of tumors is aging. But aging of what? Not just the tissue itself, but also 
the bone marrow the of bone the immune marrow. system yeah. that provides the surveillance. Mm -hmm. So it is not so clear in my mind, at this point at least, you know, is it the, just the breakdown the, of you know, the target tissue or yeah. the insufficient surveillance by the immune system that yes. allows this, yes, you yes. know, let's say oxidized, damaged uh, tissue point. that was stimulated to begin down this path of, of uh, becoming transformed and sort of de-differentiated toward, towards cancer, right? But why isn't it getting cleaned up? In fact, I want to, you know, share a very cheerful thought with you that as we speak, there's probably mm -hmm. millions of little, you know, focal formations of, cu of, of cancers and tumors forming inside each of us. Yeah. But we are quite efficiently Efficient. wiping, exactly, yeah, wiping yeah. them uh, away via a healthy functional immune system. We that think is it's that bone many. Bone marrow derived. Oh, like it's a, a lot. couple it's, millions uh, uh, that are occurring every uh, even day. But we have you know, trillions of numbers of cells. Yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. And there's tremendous amount of inflammation inside our gut being influenced exactly. by microbiome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we just flew in, so we probably got a fair dose of radiation to our skin. So we are bombarded constantly, so, true, yet true. we have a terrific defense system in the form of yeah. the immune cell, immune cell populations mm -hmm. that, you know, that scan our environment and remove those harmful, potentially, potentially deadly you know, parasites that could take us over. So it's not only the single location, it's but the body's immune system as precisely. well. Now, what is the relationship between bone marrow and immune system? So the bone marrow is, is one of the largest depots of, of stem cells that provide this, this renewing source of uh, immune surve surveilling cells, mm -hmm. uh, along with some big organs like liver and spleen and others. But bone marrow serves as the, as the, you know, the, the, supply, the supply source of uh, newly differentiating cells that differentiate from stem cells to the mature uh, cells of the, of the blood. So would it be so fair immune, to say then uh -huh. that the decreasing bone marrow over time function, density and function, uh, function, correct. function of bone marrow function over time bone marrow decreases the immune and system. And the immune cells in the liver and other mm -hmm. organs that provide you know, uh, healthy and functional, you know, white cell, monocytes, lymphocytes, sources of T cells, uh, so, you know, sources of those mm -hmm. uh, policing cells that, that scan and scavenge the damaged cells that could become neoplastic. So it, it act, as well as the breakdown of tissue organization. So we know that if you break down tissue-wide signals, you have these rogue individual cells that will try to become very selfish. Mm -hmm. And they will try to differentiate and grow, in the re which would be very reminiscent of tumors. So these, these are models that have been tested in tissues. So they would take an, an organ and they would, plant, you know, they would explant the tissue and they would see that if you stop providing organizing signals, something that will keep the tissue as one solid block, all of a sudden you see all these clones escaping on their own. So it takes, so cancer is, is a failure of organization. It's when, it's when members of an organization become sort of, they go rogue and they become so selfish that they just do anything to survive at the expense of the tissue host. So, all right, so now we have this insane parasite that's mm -hmm. built up inside of us, mm -hmm. sending this SOS mm -hmm. signal of inflammation. You're first cutting off that signal of inflammation and Correct. then your second telling this tumor, die. Correct. It's time to die. Correct. Um, okay, so that's your process across all three. All of, three. All three. Okay. At the, and mo at the moment, yes. At, okay, and so the one that's in, uh, the one that's in, in human trials, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I guess, I guess maybe a, a good question to ask is between those three, if they're all kind of, they're not the, they are the same two molecules that are doing? The same platform. They contain the same anti-inflammatory. Uh -huh. one, one of them contains an antibody fragment that targets, so on the surface, that targets this particle to be taken up by uh, tumor cells with even greater affinity. We've engineered that so we can target it to the brain a bit more and a bit more to cells uh, okay. that so are harder to reach. 
Okay. So, so different parts of the body is the different three? Potentially, potentially. potentially. Okay. But the core okay. of the molecule is the same. Got it, okay. Between the first two molecules. Okay. And, and okay, so now the one that's, the one that's in human, um, what, in human clinical trials now, what was the success in the mouse trials? Um, to tell us about what the results were. So again, going back, so initially when we tested our hypothesis for this approach, so we wanted to see uh, would it work in tumors that just from my personal, personal experience were near and dear to me for, uh, and we tested it in metastatic colon and ovarian cancers. Mm -hmm. So we took uh, cancer models, uh, cancer cell lines that were made resistant to doxorubicin. So they were growing just fine in the presence of chemotherapy mm. and, uh, and we then took these clones, implanted them in mice, allowed them to grow to take and then we gave our drug. And our drug incidentally contained at that time about 3% of the currently used doxorubicin. So mm. even when 100% was resistant, we were able to completely block the growth of those tumors at about 3%. Wow. The dose, correct. So that, wow. that served in our minds as sort of a validation of principle and that was in the, the beginning. That was the blocking the SOS signal. That was the blocking the SOS and activating, uh -huh. and activating the apoptosis. Did it signal. die too? When we increased Even the dose slightly, it did. Like to six or eight percent or to 12 or? Uh, we, so actually we started an even lower dose. So when we increased the dose of the anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. not the chemo, mm -hmm. the, the chemo dose didn't really matter. Yeah. What needed to be blocked was the SOS signal. Yes, so yes. we were able to increase the anti-inflammatory component, maybe 50%. 50. Cool, yeah. and then that and, caused the and apoptosis. And that caused apoptosis and shrinkage wow. of breast cancer model. Wow. Which was at that time also, actually still remains quite difficult to treat, even in mice. Did it fully die or it shrunk? So it shrunk. It shrunk. It shrunk to the point of be, being barely, if, if noticeable, in the lab. Mm. But what was very interesting is that the persistence of the response was impressive. That's really important, yeah. So we went out to approximately day 50, which is quite a typical cutoff point in mice. And yeah, it translates yeah, yeah. to yeah. something like, you know, somewhere between three and nine months in human life. Mm -hmm. And the response actually persisted. So that was... Stayed small. Stayed small. And it didn't huh. regrow. And how often were they administering? So at that time, we gave seven injections so every other day. One injection every, every other day. Every other day. Seven times. Correct. Okay. And the, that's it for the whole period? That's it. Seven total injections. The concept was weeks. that if this is indeed a unicellular self cells, de differentiating, evolving cells, they are evolving towards a unicellular status, so single cells, yes. which is a parasitic or bacterial infection. And we should treat metastatic cancer as such, as a really severe infection. How do we treat infections? We don't give them a whopping dose of anything once. We give them appropriate dose of antibiotic intravenously for about a week. So that was, that yeah. was the conceptual framework. We took that framework when we saw that we're getting fairly uniform response against across five divergent tumor types. So we then, uh, since then, we, extend, so we ex extended our uh, studies from colon and ovarian to then breast, glioblastoma, brain tumor, multiple myeloma, and uh, uh, some others, one more solid. Uh, but then, thank you, Ryan. We actually, then we were lucky enough, fortuitously, we were uh, thrown a challenge. If we thought that our drug was so effective that we were offered to test our therapeutic in the, in the genetic model of pancreatic cancer, KPC model, that model offers a unique advantage over everything else that we had done at, up until that point is that that tumor model behaves very similar to a human patient. It is minimally sensitive to chemotherapy almost not sensitive to chemo, radiation, and uh, immunotherapies have had really hard time making a dent. So that, w you know, in our minds, that would have been the closest approximation to the human model. 
So we eagerly took up the challenge. And it was uh, quite gratifying to see the results. At that point, we decided to make it even more realistic because we wanted to subject the tumor system to a more prolonged exposure to our drug so we can get at those pesky stem cells mm -hmm. that have a very long life cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you, kill it, if you hit it today, you know, they may be dormant for three days. They may not divide for a week. So that's why we wanted to go every day for five days. Mm -hmm. just like we would treat a really severe infection in yes. a hospital. Yes. And we saw a near uniform shrinkage, but not only shrinkage. When we cut those tumors, what we saw was essentially nothing but a scar uh. with wholesale rearrangement of not only the tumor, but the immune microenvironment. So we saw disappearance of those suppressive T regulatory cells, mm. which keep our good immune system out of the tumor. We saw near complete disappearance of new blood vessels because we blocked the SOS signals and they awesome. could no longer attract them. And uh, we saw a pretty remarkable tumor shrinkage on top of that. Uh, so that, pre that gives us the, the greatest hope that we are onto something promising and gives us some sense of anticipation of Good. what we're going to see in the clinic. Amazing. So. Thank you. Good man. work. High Thank five. You. Too. High five. Thank yeah. you. This is so good. So important. This is a big team, right? That is able to do this. Very big, very diverse team. Smart uh, team. Scattered all over the globe, uh, which uh, you know gives me an incredible appreciation for really people's contributions from all walks of you know, life, disciplines, countries, corners of the world. How many total people are you at? Oh boy. Uh, so. We, we, while we grew organically, we ended up growing very quickly over the last year or two. So it was three founders initially who all came from extremely diverse background. You know, physician scientists, biotech patent attorney, uh, physical chemists, then uh, mm -hmm. a finance prof a professor and a professional, and the subsequently uh, Ryan Witt, who is an entrepreneur and a regulatory mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. guru. Uh, we, and from that point on, we're collaborating with the world's premier nanotechnology nano formulators, yeah, yeah, yeah. toxicology experts, uh, clinical wow. trialists. We are now are proud and honored to have one of the leading oncologists in Australia lead our upcoming phase one trial, who is incredibly excited oh, yes. and understands the approach that we're taking. So it's, it, it's a humbling experience, truly. Yeah to build you know, so many smarter people around yes, you and yes. have them basically yes. show us the path forward. We always so. like highlighting the team because uh, the person that's the leading you know, the voice of the team is usually the one that gets a lot of the attention and highlight, but it would be zero. Um, and that's exactly what we have here at, with Simulation. We have our producing partner, Ron Vargas. Mm -hmm. Without him wouldn't be anything. Elisa Sinelli, our photographer. There's all these team members that, yeah. that help make it really a, a, the, the thing come true. So um, amazing. Okay, let's walk you through because I want to still get to, yeah, let's, let's get to some of, the, some of our questions. Do you want to mm -hmm. highlight anything else from what you're doing that you think is really important to mention before I walk you through a couple questions? Maybe, why don't we uh, take some of the questions? All right, or go through it. It, it, it might, exactly, up. it might remind me. I might be okay. missing some crucial piece that uh, we'd like to share. Okay, cool. So how about as, as a first question, as somebody that really got deep into understanding the brain, um, do you think that consciousness is localized in the nervous system? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely Ex not. Tell us more. So consciousness is is probably diff so consciousness is definitely a product of our nervous system. It is almost certainly not localized in any nucleus of the brain. It is clearly a distributed function, and it's a function of but it occurs all within the body, though. Or does some For of each individual person, yes. Okay, so consciousness is then localized in the body itself. So, hmm, perhaps it might be simpler. Or might be, I, I might be able to get to the point easier if I mm -hmm. tell you my, my, how I view the brain. So, okay. so the brain yeah. is 
in the nervous system by extension. So nervous system is, is the most refined way of processing and integrating us in terms of our larger environment. Yes. Making us adaptable and surviving in yeah. our environment yes. and providing the most appropriate outputs, behavioral outputs, you know, motor outputs mm -hmm. in response to the inputs yes. in the environment that we find. So that is probably, that's where I'd say there's enough scientific basis for me to almost unambiguously st you know, state that much. Where the, the, the larger conscience, you know, is a societal conscience or our personal conscience, where that lies, I would probably, uh, you know, leave somewhere in between. Yeah, so, you, so there's, a, there's a line that kind of gets a little blurred out of, once I get my inside consciousness, mm -hmm. then there's maybe some sort of a line between your consciousness and mine, but then there's also some sort of a connection Correct. between the consciousnesses and even the whole earth consciousness. You know, and it's very difficult to disentangle because there's so many nonverbal cues that we are passing as we speak, mm -hmm. passing between the two of us, that there are, you know, millions of waves, sound waves, you know, yeah. visual waves, et cetera. So there's so many nuances being you know, exchanged as we speak. And it takes a tremendous amount of integrative ability to process that and then you know, reverberate, reciprocate. So uh, that's why I think the incredible difficulty in assessing what that thing is, I think, comes from. Okay, that's good. I, uh, that's good. That was a good answer. So, I mean, it's, it's the most realistic answer I can give yeah, you without, without dumbing it down, but, which is an enormously you, complex, you know, complex subject. You did, so. a, you did a quite a great job at it. Do you think that the, mm, you. Do you think that the cosmos birthing the nervous system, the human nervous system mm -hmm. into existence. Do you think that this is the only vehicle of perceiving and understanding the cosmos? Or do you think there are other sorts of these nervous systems around other stars? So do you think we're alone in that sense in the cosmos? I think it's very difficult to presume that we're alone. Now, every five or 10 years, as, for example, my cousin finds a new nuclear, so sub-nuclear particle. He's a nuclear physicist. Things that I can only hope to understand. Yet, somehow, distantly, I understand that there are levels of entire universes yeah. that I don't even understand. <laughs> yeah. So, it's very difficult for me to imagine that this is the only way to perceive the universe, that this is the only universe that exists out mm -hmm. there. Because how, how do we perceive? So our perception is limited initially by our sensory organs, which are only evolved to deal with a very narrow portion of the spectrum. If you take you know, the, the, the light spectrum, we're on a very narrow spectrum, right? Same thing with the sound spectrum. Now, dig deeper. How many different uh, you know, sensory mechanisms you have in your technology? Yeah. You, know, you, you sense something that we, we don't. We don't have sensory you know, machinery to to sense those things. Now extend that. I think uh, it's, it's clear to me that there's so many new, so many more levels out there that yeah. we're not even pre oh, at the yeah. moment, at the moment. And but soon we'll augment our ability to feel and perceive and that will be very fascinating when we, when, as we're getting there. What do, you, what do you think about this new age of genetic engineering that's coming into play? So even more specifically with potential augmentations in intelligence, in metabolism. Yeah, yeah. T tell Fantastic. Us. Fantastic. So this is one of the subject areas that I'm glad you bring up. I forgot to talk about. This is a beautiful example. So for the last 20 years, I've been holding my breath, right? Ever since the, <coughs> the sequencing of the human genome. And ever since people kept tossing around the junk DNA and my, you know, my heart would bleed because it, just, it was inconceivable to me that 97% of our genome was junk, yet I couldn't reconcile. If you go back, not only, not only between two individuals do we have a near identical coding genome, Correct, yes. but then when you go back to other species, we're like between 98 to 60% identical with some lowly little beast out there in the forest. 50% to a banana. Makes no <laughs> sense, right? How is the rest of the junk? Yeah. So in my mind, it was clearly the regulatory sequences where the money was, so to speak. Mm. You can, so the only difference between 
you in a really tall, a really short person mm. in a very simplistic mm -hmm. form is the regulatory sequence, not the coding. It's not what you're made of. You're both made of identical collagen. It's just how long yeah. that person's collagen gene is turned on so the uh -huh. limbs become longer uh -huh. or shorter, yes, but yes. they're made of the identical material, And right? that's the way the gene expresses. And exactly. Okay. And not only gene, now extend that, metabolism. Epigenetics, how do you the get molecular the clock to express. That's the question, then. So the regulatory sequences, okay, which so we okay. know because what? it's been decoded. The mm -hmm. encode, mm -hmm. the human genome project. We have that information lying there. Up until a few years ago, it used to be called junk DNA. So now, mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. have realized that that's the regulatory knobs. Mm -hmm. And I would venture to guess that in the next five years, you will have knobs that mm -hmm. make you age faster or slower. We already know that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, metabolic measures, very primitive, first versions, you know, metformin, oh, mTOR, exactly, calorie restriction. It will slow you maybe that down. Would speed, but... Exactly, speed up your metabolism, speed up your aging, yeah. you can slow it down by calorie restriction, other medicines that are currently in clinical trials, right? mTOR, metformin, other agents. But do, what knobs do we have then? Do we have the knob for height and the knob for <sighs> eye color, the knob for intelligence? Where are we at these knobs? Because these gene expressions, this, they're difficult to understand the genes for intelligence. That's a very difficult one. Very difficult. Maybe the gene for height or is it just a couple? It's a little bit easier maybe? So they're difficult to understand because it's not only the matter of genes but where they end up at the same time. So as you're building a building, physical structure, mm -hmm. You can't say that if I make one column taller, my building is going to be taller. So you have the coordinate, exactly. Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking in terms of networks and building holistic three-dimensional structures, you begin to understand you know, how complex, yes, but you need the right framework, right? If you're not even in the same vicinity, if, you're not, if your framework is wrong, it's very difficult to get anywhere. If you get the framework right, then it becomes just a matter of machinery, technology, and tools, which are skyrocketing in complexity and ability, ability to process information. So now I'm very hopeful that in the next five to 10 years, we'll probably have as much progress as we made in the previous 40 or 50 years yes. in biotech. Yes, and it seems to continuously be happening in the last couple of decades, as these next couple of years have as much progress as the last couple of decades. I and it, it's really beautiful seeing more and more energy and talent and resources being dedicated mm -hmm. to that. A question about what do you think as a lot of wealth is mm -hmm. being concentrated mm -hmm. in just a couple people, eight people have as much as the bottom four mm -hmm. billion people. What do you think, even though the Pinker argument's true, everybody's slowly coming up, Correct. but all the, I, all the technologies right. exacerbating the wealth inequality, Correct. what do you think's gonna happen with that wealth inequality? So I tend to be this you know, non-conformist thinker you know, in terms of, yeah, I'm not sure which box I belong in, okay? So the inequality per se, I don't think is what matters. And I know that because I'm a big proponent, you know, a big fan of behavioral economics. So I understand the, the heuristics and the little traps that we fall into psychologically, right? Listen, as long as, ev as long as the weakest and the most disabled member of our society has safe shelter, access to safe and nutritious food, and access to medical care, I think we've done a great job, right? So, but we don't now, and and that yeah. what bothers me yeah, now. Me, yeah, me too. So, right. but that so, and actually, it's problem, close to like a couple billion people don't have that. that so that is a problem, right? Yeah. Be, why it's a problem? So, your family. so humanistic problem number one. If you can relate. It's very inhumane. Exactly. It's very inhumane. Yeah. You see other persons suffer, you feel for them. You want that to change to stop, right? Yeah. But also, what you're doing is you're robbing yourself of the ingenuity, innovation, and motivation that these folks could have provided. And they could have exactly. invented stuff. They exactly. could have provided things. Yeah. Uh, so, th so I don't tend to focus on the, the, the gap so much as long as, so in other words, if, if I was, if You're I thinking had, about bringing the baseline Exactly. Yeah. So to me, that's number one. Yeah. Clearly, fairness enters the argument no matter what. Right? 
there's nothing we can do about that. That's just human nature. It, it, People the, don't the like reason, unfairness. The, you're right about focusing on the baseline moving up. I yeah. think that's a really good way to look at things. Absolutely. Then there's the other f side of the coin of the conversation, which is that it is starting to look more and more like the end of the middle class, as though it is you're either picking the super rich mm. or you're poor. And at that point, then a speciation Correct. seems to be what is going to occur. Well, you're destroying you're destroying the fabric of society. And, and that, that's essentially and, what you're and doing. That, and that is actually could be as bad as artificial general intelligence or bio warfare or any of these up and coming major controversies. And that you know, I can only hope that humanity, you know, the political class, has learned from the experience of the French Revolution. Yeah. German, you know, the 1920s, German society, uh, the Soviet Union, the, 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 you know, the incredible experiment in torturing folks that I come from, uh, and other societal you know, experiments. I hope we learn from that, that by destroying the, the fabric where the majority of people can safely navigate the streets, can walk around without fear of being robbed by mobs of hungry insecure, yeah, yeah. unprovided for people. So yeah. I hope we learn from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, beyond that. You know. We haven't learned a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, it doesn't appear if we've learned that, anything. That's my pathological optimist uh, you know, speaking. Because so. we look out at Market Street, our home here, uh -huh. and we see yeah, half yeah. of the people on the street are techies, yeah. and half of the people are sleeping on the street. Yeah, and that's unsheltered people that... I and, agree. And so this is a, it's a very strange dichotomy just out the door, 50-50 split. And uh, if, if, we're all, if we're Ron saying we haven't learned a thing is because why are our resources not you know, being intelligently allocated towards that process. Maybe because we focus so much on creativity and innovation and all these things. You know, we got those little electric scooters that cost a dollar to start before we took care of the person yeah. that's right there on the street and they're parked next to each other. Mm. And it's so interesting how that occurred. So, listen, I agree. And in fact, I agree completely. And what, what you're saying very soberly is sort of the, it's a proof point for the 2002 Nobel Prize in Economics that was given to two psychologists, right? Kahneman and Tversky for behavioral yeah. economics. Such a good book. We Being don't focus, so all those fundamentals are not sexy. I don't know how to say that politically correct, okay? Those fundamentals aren't sexy. Aren't sexy, nobody cares. That's a good Bel way to Believe it or not, no, you know, no one cares about providing sufficient Gosh. mental health, <coughs> housing, <coughs> all those logistics. Right, it's very difficult to charm people into providing social safety nets. Uh, versus innovation versus or creativity. In, exactly. But the, what about so, viewing helping as innovation and creativity? Some people do do that. So, and there are prizes, which is really true. a good way true, to true, motivate true, people through prizes. And that's why, yeah. so that goes back to, uh, precisely, that goes back to my realization that I can either complain that the entire world doesn't care about my cancer patients, mm. Or I can find a way to communicate and make it sound important. Yeah. So again, others. it goes back to motivation. It goes back to being able to to marshal those resources. Yeah. But communication is uh, communication is a skill, and it's yeah. a very difficult it's a difficult challenge. So, and and that is obviously a lot of what we do on this program is we try and take the brilliance of so many people, communicate it relatably to get people That's inspired and to get them to take action, get them to care more, to share the content. Um, how about, do you think that we are in a computer simulation? Oof. Uh, so, we are definitely in a, you know, in a sufficiently computer manipulated age that there is, uh, we're at the point where there's not sufficient amount of interference with a collection of data taking place that uh, at least the younger generations are sufficiently influenced that they are becoming inseparable yeah. from the, you know, yeah. whatever you call computer age, the digital age. Yeah. They navigate in the world that now is almost like a blended world of yeah. real and digital. Yeah, so, exactly. <clears throat> I mean, I see that. I see that in my own kids. I see yeah. that in patients, in, in, in my patients' kids. 
Yeah. The definitely. iPhone, iPad babies. You know, and, and now the interaction that we have, even as physicians, with our, with our, you know, with our patients in their, in their children is very, is very different. So not, not only, so five, ten years ago, we used to, you know, talk about, you know, the Dr. Google consult. It's actually much more sophisticated. It's much deeper now. So you're dealing with chat rooms. You're dealing with uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, sources of information that we never used to even enter the conversation between a physician and a patient, for example. And I'm sure it enters the same domains of these conversations uh, we, when you make your financial decisions, when you, when you buy you know, big items, or when you're contemplating you know, other serious decisions in your life. So it's, it's, it's definitely changing. I, I wonder if this direct tie to the digital age is also enriching more people to understand that the world around us is, could be programmed digitally everything. Um, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, <laughs> he, he said a thing. Uh, so he gave me a way out. I don't know, so he gave me a way out. Uh, but, uh, gave you ways out. Yeah. Uh, so a thing. So I would say, I would say human mind. Yeah, we've had that before. It's pretty like close that to that. Yeah. It, uh, so it's been pushed to the brink before. And it, you know, it seems to find uh, its way out. Sometimes eventually, and sometimes not right away. Sometimes not in most great, you know, graceful ways. But I think it's got reserve, and it's got enough of uh, you know built-in flexibility and agility to really surprise us yet. Yeah, I totally agree. You I know, hope we I hope we survive past these next Fermi filters. And that, I think that ho are ho hope is the right statement. Yeah, so yeah, is that yeah. the right term? <laughs> Awesome. Um, this has been such a pleasure. Did you have a good time? I had a great time. Thank you for really uh, very probing and interesting <laughs> questions, and uh, I enjoyed this tremendously. Good. I'm really Take happy care. to hear that. And we thank you and your team for all your hard work um, yeah. into pushing the brink of what's known and unknown between healing our bodies from um, what's actually occurring, the pathology. So you're, you're right there. You're at the forefront. Thank you very much for doing that. And we hope you great success in your human clinical trials. Thank you kindly um, for inviting yes. us. And I'm very grateful to my team. And I'm humbled by the tremendous, tremendous work that they're doing. You, Thank you. You're, you're, you're incredible. I, I, I really enjoyed your mind and your time on the show. Um, let's close out. We'll close out to you guys. We'll say thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Give us a like. Give us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Subscribe. Smash that subscribe button. Join us in the simulation community. We'd greatly appreciate it. We have the Imix Biopharma link in the bio. Go check them out. Reach out to them. Do join us on Patreon. We need your help. We need this to be sustainable. We need it to grow over time, to get more of these little highlight clips out there, to grow into a massive creative endeavor where we bring other brilliant people in to try and change the world and build a beautiful future and ask more of these thought-provoking questions. So join us on Patreon as well. Thank you for tuning in. Share this content with other people. Get them inspired to think about it. And we will see you soon. Thank you, Ron Vargas, producing partner. Boom. See you later.